Hey everybody, I'm delighted to be here today and uh, today we're going to talk about some of the technical tips for ICSI and blastocyst biopsy. Before we get started, I'd like to show you around our, our new lab that uh, we're just opening up um, in our training center, IV, uh, Embryo Director IVF Academy. And uh, this is our andrology side, our ICSI micro setups. Um, and uh, good to have our own space, good to spread out and have more room and uh, uh, get some more students coming through here at, at, a, at a time. So something we're going to start with, I want to talk to you today about uh, some of the equipment maintenance we have and more importantly really the injector maintenance. And some of the Hello everybody. There's a couple of things I'd like to show about maintenance of equipment. Um, a lot of us have these these new uh, newer IM11s, and um, I've been to a couple labs where I've been consulting, and um, um, they'll have a, a very nice setup, a whole micro setup with lasers and everything, but then won't be using them. And so I'll ask why they won't use them, and they'll say it's broken. And oftentimes it's because one of the injectors is plugged. And so what I would like to recommend is um, that every time you get one of these guys, it has a, a rod in it. I always save that rod. I usually tape it to my power source or somewhere near the scope. And what I like about these newer uh, injectors is that you can um, uh, move them around. You can just, you know, just loosen these up, tighten them up. You can change the angles. I had one student here that uh, didn't realize that when this was dialed down, um, you know, she noticed that I had this set up in my lab and they were like, well, why, did, why my scope doesn't have that? And I'm, I said, I'm pretty sure you do. When you go back, just turn it back around. And so, uh, you know, I'd just like to share, you know, a couple of things that I've come across over the years training people. So in this is air, and the nice thing is that if there's ever any uh, any leak uh, capillary action when you put it into your into your media, it usually means there's a leak, and it either has to be here or up here when you put the tool in, or back here where you put the um, where it's attached here. And so kind of work your way backwards, make sure your tool's in there. Inside here is a is a rubber piece in here and this piece seats down in there to seal it up. So sometimes it's just a simple thing of just tightening this up a little bit more and to squish that rubber down. If that doesn't seal things up, it must, you know, it could be back here. And so make sure that this is, this is, lo this is tightened because this will come loose and you just need to tighten it back up. Or it could be in here. All you have to do is push this out, put in and pull it out. And if this is getting wore out because the system spins on it, you might want to take a razor blade, cut it off. And then all you have to do is push forward, pull back, and it should seal everything back up. This one works the exact same way. On this end, you just, you just push forward, um, push in on the, on, the, on the rubber piece, and pull out, and it's, uh, you can pull it out and you may, may cut it off. Um, don't use a pair of scissors. You want a nice, clean, straight cut. Scissors will squish it and really not seal it up. So to put it back in, you just push in, pull back, and it seals everything up. You know, turn the magnet on, magnetize it down. So a couple of things I recommend doing periodically. When I have these injectors that don't work somewhere, or any time I go in consulting, um, I usually carry a kit with me that has one of these rods in it. And a really nice thing to do is just take this back piece off, pull this piece here out, take the top front off, and every now and, and, every now and then, about once or twice a year, depending on uh, the amount of usage, you just want to push that rod through there and make sure that there's no glass pieces. You can see this rubber piece that fell out here. Um, every now and then you got to replace that. In your um, um, box you ended up getting a um, some extra pieces of those you can actually order them as well so I just want to clean that out uh, periodically uh, put the rubber back in there and yeah, put the rubber back in and you can see where the rubber fits in there just perfect and inside this what I like about these new ones is it doesn't come out. We used to have this ones that these, this piece in the front where the tool would go through would fall out and you lose that and your whole tool holder wouldn't work. 
And this piece right here costs about $200, $250. So uh, nothing works without that working. So I got that going there. Uh, just uh, just tighten it back up. It's got a little rubber piece there. Make sure that that's in. As I said, anywhere there's leakage, this could be loose, and now you got air going in. Make sure it's nice and tight. Finger tight's good enough. Um, pull it, and everything's tightened up, and you should be good to go. Um, I had a, a case where uh, they pulled in some oil. They got some oil up in here, and it could have been either in here. Or, and actually, over time, I noticed it was up in the up in the up in the uh, tubing and you can order new tubing it's always good to have an extra set of tubing laying around um, doesn't mean that this is all gone you can always just run I would run pure alcohol through it uh, swing it around a lot um, make sure that all the alcohol is out let it air dry for several uh, several days make sure that there's no alcohol in the line and you should be okay if there's any alcohol in the line I definitely wouldn't use it again because um, those vapors then are now going through your pipette into your media and could be traumatic to the oocytes. Okay, so a couple of final things I'd like to talk about with injectors is uh, what do you do if your injector breaks and uh, you still have uh, some mixy to do, biopsy to do, uh, when I first got into human IVF, I ended up uh, actually in bovine when I was cloning cows. Um, you know, we have tubing that we could um, use either mouth pipetting, and uh, all the haters can email me. But uh, in a uh, in a uh, you know emergency situation, I don't mouth pipette anymore. Um, I have done some biopsy mouth pipetting. I'm actually working. I don't teach it in my training program, um, but it's always good to have this tubing, this Tigon tubing laying around because all you have to do is attach this to the end of a, uh, of a tool holder and you're ready to, um, to use it. You can just put your tool on, attach it to your, your piece, uh, take a syringe. You could just put it on here. When I first started cloning cows, this is how we used to uh, clone cows. We'd pull the embryo up with our our hands and we would gently release them. Of course you want to fill up some extra media, um, possibly some oil to slow it down. Um, a couple of things that uh, I encourage having people lay, you know, having laying around. Um, if you needed to, you could probably pull this tubing out of here, you know, in a pinch if you don't have the tubing laying around. Pull this out of here and it's gonna mess this piece of tubing up, but if you put a needle in there that you know a large gauge needle and poke it in there without uh, poking yourself and just put the syringe on the end of that you could do the exact same thing you could use this this tubing in the tool holder as um, um, as, a, as you know for your biopsy or ICSI or holding um, you know in a, in a pinch if I needed if my holding side broke I would just move this I, I could just use one of these, it's the easiest. The most delicate piece you would be doing is, is uh, say, biopsy or ICSI. So you want to make sure you have the good injector on this side. A lot of people, if they have oil injectors, they'll use them on the holding side because they're um, not as gentle as the air injectors. So just an idea to use that. Um, every now and then, you'll get uh, a piece on here if it gets, you know, because that that tension on there will poke a hole in it. All you have to do is cut it, is come in here, cut it off there, uh, put it back on there, and you're ready to go again. So, and finally, um, I, I keep pretty much just about every style of injector. I do have some oil injectors as well. Uh, not many people come to me and say they, they have oil injectors, but I have some if you need to uh, work with those. This works the exact same way. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen one of these types of air injectors, like a mushroom injector they call them. Um, it's really just a, a screw, that's all these guys are, just a you know, lefty loosey righty tight, you know, screw it in, screw it out, and you're pulling air and pushing air. Um, I really like uh, the air injectors, uh, one of the original ones, it was the, uh, was the mushroom, um, Research Instruments had the original mushroom I, I believe. 
that's the same kind of thing. A little bit of weight on there can start pushing a hole on that. Um, just pull that off of there, cut it off, put it back on. Um, the same kind of thing if you're in a pinch, if it did break, all you have to do is pull that off of there, uh, pull it out. You could um, put, a, put a needle in there and, uh, and um, use a syringe. When I did bovine embryo cloning, I would, uh, we actually use syringes for all of our biopsy and, and nucleations and things like that. So um, it can be done. Uh, I know there's some programs out there that, that do uh, some mouth pipetting on their ICSI. Um, of course, more and more people, like uh, as people come through my training program, I don't think I've had but one group of uh, students come through that mouth pipetted. And um, they actually brought all their own mouth pipetters because they didn't think I would have them. So um, at any rate, um, this was a great, uh, great alternative to when something breaks and you gotta, gotta get it going. Okay, right now I want to talk to you about some dish preparation. There's a couple things I really strongly encourage people to do and I, some of the mistakes I see in a lot of laboratories I go to. Um, whether you're making an ICSI dish or a biopsy dish, I encourage everyone to only make a maximum of two dishes at a time. No matter how you make your dishes, if you want to make uh, you know, four drops, five drops, individual drops, um, you don't want these bot drops to um, evaporate and potentially change your osmolarity. And I always say it's the equivalent of putting a, a goldfish in a saltwater tank and, and then putting it back into a freshwater tank. Um, when you uh, let that evaporate too long, it will um, uh, the fish will swim around, but it's eventually going to die. So we're going to get into some biopsy here, and uh, I got I have uh, about three biopsies I'm going to look at here. Um, the first one is just a conventional biopsy, uh, the basic laser technique, and um, I have an Octax laser, Hamilton Thorn laser. Um, both lasers seem to work equally as well. Um, some people have pre preferences for one laser for another. Um, um, my personal favorite is the, uh, the Hamilton Thorn. Um, I also have um, a Saturn V uh, laser in my, um, in my training lab. But the real key here is to, uh, we have our um, pulse set at about 500 uh, milliseconds. And so you typically will hit it, maybe get it to collapse. Um, I'm going to pull in some tissue here. And um, one of the real key points I really try to emphasize is that you don't hit the same spot over and over again. You have to basically find a piece of tissue, and it's virtually impossible to say you're going to get five to seven cells or not hit a cell in between. And just work your way up through that tissue back and forth. I find that day five embryos are a little bit easier to biopsy than day six. And um, that was, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm assuming this is a day five of biopsy quite easily. Just pull out some tissue. I move my embryo down to the six o'clock part of the drop, um, just to not confuse it with the, uh, the tissue that I have set aside for testing. Now we're going to look at a hatch blast assist. Um, a lot of times our day six embryos are hatched and uh, the day six embryos can also be a little more challenging to biopsy. Um, find a spot in between the cells, um, hit it once with the laser, get it to start collapsing, and then I'll immediately start pulling tissue into my biopsy tool. And just like the day five, uh, a little faster, this one might take a few more hits, and I will work my way up through that tissue, not hitting the same place. Every time you hit it with the laser, it should come loose a little bit more. If you find that it's not, um, get into some fresh tissue and eventually it'll come off. I find sometimes it's uh, when I'm training, it's, it's easier to maybe uh, pop up the laser a little bit higher, uh, maybe to a six or 700 when you're first learning, and then bring it back down. I usually keep mine between four and uh, 500. So here's an example of what that looks like, grabbing a hold of it down by the inner cell mass and uh, just pulling the tissue away from it. 
It's a good sized piece of tissue, um, decent size, uh, not too small, not too big in my opinion. And now I'm going to go into the snap biopsy. I call it snap because it's simple, um, it's natural, an alternative procedure. Um, but the real key to this is putting your holding pipette on the bottom of the dish so your tool does not go underneath it. The only place it can go is now above it. Uh, focus on the edge of that holding pipette. Um, then grabbing some tension on your uh, biopsy needle and popping it through there and taking the tissue out. This uh, procedure I've been doing for about uh, uh, two, a little over two years. And in the beginning, I thought that my pregnancy rates were uh, much higher. And I found I just had to make some adjustments to some of our cryo procedures for our other uh, staff members, and everybody's uh, methods came up. This is some data from a recent uh, submission to ASRM this year. Uh, we tried, as I said, we have the Octax, Hamilton Thorn, and the SNAP procedure. You can see uh, a good number of embryos biopsied, and there's no difference in the rates of euploidy between the, the three subgroups. Um, you can see a trend towards fewer no amplifications in the SNAP biopsy, but the ongoing pregnancy rates are equal between the two groups. So. One, we know we're not making any harm and um, you're getting some good outcomes with it. I find it's easier with our day six embryos as well. Now we're going to get into some tubing of the cells. One of the things that I always encourage everyone to do, regardless of what uh, center you're using, everybody kind of has a different way of preparing their um, their tubes. Some people like less than five microliters, some people less than two microliters. Just see where your cells are going and make sure you follow their rules. Um, I find it's easier to preload the, the tubes, especially when training. Um, when you get more proficient, you can dry load the tubes. Um, but the real key is that you want to be able to see the cells going into the tube. So I use the smaller bore uh, tips, and you're going to use a different tip for each embryo. Um, you have your embryos in your biopsy dish still remaining there and the way I like to do it is um, in our laboratory we if you uh, biopsy you also do the freeze and you also do the tubing of the cells you're going to pick up a little bit of your uh, buffer that you are given by the genomics company you're going to pick up your embryo pick up your, uh, your cells rather then you're going to wash them through your, um, through your buffer a couple of times. Um, I like to use one drop of 50 microliters. Uh, some people will make two drops, uh, 20 microliters. I move that around, but the real key is that you don't get any oil transferred into your tube. So you're going to take your preloaded uh, tube, and I like to set my, my bore um, for my 3 microliter stripper tip at less than 1 microliter, and then I'll watch the cell go into the tube. If I can't see the cell, I will go back and check in, uh, in my dish to make sure I got it. But most of the time I can see the cell. I will say that a lot of times if you don't see the cell right away, go ahead and send it. Um, I would say that 99 or 98.5% of the time the tissue is there. Um, the reason why I say that is because we have about a 1.5% no read rate. Um, I've had I've heard some people say that if it's less than four percent, uh, you're probably taking too many cells. Um, I prefer to keep the uh, uh, the the no read rates really very low. Um, I don't think we take too many cells. I think the key is that uh, we're loading the cells properly. We know that we see the cells going in. Uh, no oil in there to interfere with the, uh, the process at the genomics laboratory and following their rules on how much media to load. As you can see in here, if you get down to the bottom of the tube, you're going to see those cells go in. Drop it off. You can see how I put the cells towards the back. Uh, that's how I know I'm done. All right, now let's uh, jump into some mixy. Okay, we're going to start off with some dish preparation and very much like the um, biopsy dish preparation I recommend only making two dishes at a time uh, really for uh, evaporation purposes and I would say ICSI dishes are even more sensitive 
because we're using smaller drops. Uh, typical ICSI dishes are anywhere between 5 and 10 microliters. Uh, these are 10 microliter droplets I'm making here. I start off with the PVP in the middle using a 7% PVP. And then I'll go to my uh, Heapies buffered media, which is simply uh, my sperm wash media. I use a sperm wash for everything from uh, sperm washing and uh, use it for my bi my biopsy and I do it for use it for ICSI. Sperm wash media is essentially HTF heapies with protein already added to it. So I just try to keep it simple and uh, use the same media throughout all the processes in the lab. I will do um, the two dishes and I'll add the oil at the same time and then we'll be uh, ready to do some mixy. So I'm going to show you a couple different uh, ICSI systems here. Um, this is the more traditional way of just ICSI and, you know, aspirate and break. Um, you know, basically you want to inject away from, uh, you know, you don't want to inject through the polar body. Um, that's where the meiotic spindle's at. And so the key here is, um, and a lot of people ask me why I leave the sperm back behind, and there's no reason why. I think it just comes from my days of uh, when I first started doing ICSI, we did a lot of stirring and things. So I'll go in. Uh, the membrane hasn't broken. I push in about halfway and allow the um, uh, membrane to relax and the zona to come back over it. I'll aspirate right away. And what I really want to focus on here is after the membrane broke, you just saw it break right there. As the sperm starts coming down, I'll push forward with my needle right here and you can see that membrane pop back over my needle. And I'll come back to the center and I'll release my sperm. The real key is that you're through that membrane. If you end up doing your injection you see cytoplasm coming back underneath into your funnel, it means you're not through the membrane and you just need to push forward a little bit. Here I'm going to demonstrate it again. You just push in about halfway, one third to one halfway in. Allow the, the zona to relax. Bring your sperm to the tip. I give a nice quick aspiration. And once I see it break, I'll turn my injector, make sure I'm not, I don't just keep aspirating. There it goes, it broke right there. You see now the sperm's coming down, and I push forward. And you see that membrane just pop back over the, the tip of the needle and I know that I'm in the cytoplasm. That's the real key to fertilization. You'll get, you'll maximize your fertilization if you consistently uh, know you're in there. I like to squeeze the cytoplasm down around the sperm because um, once that cytoplasm is in contact with the sperm, it should fertilize. Um, if it doesn't fertilize, it could be maybe a slightly immature or uh, you know, or post mature. Um, kind of bringing back the old school, I heard uh, Joe Conahan give a talk over the summer, um, and I've uh, spoken with Aaron Fisher at Pacific uh, uh, Fertility in uh, San Fran area, and so I wanted, you know, I have usually around 75 to 80 percent fertilization rates in my laboratory. Um, I just wanted to see if there was a way I could maximize more better fertilization, so I started bringing the stirring method back in, and. Um, this is what it looks like here. So just like I, not treating it any different, I have my sperm back a little bit, but I'm going to go in. And the key is that you want to see that membrane break. You can see on this one, the membrane broke right away. So I come back a little bit. And I'm going to, it's not that you don't do any aspiration, but you do just, just minimal aspiration because you're, you're through the membrane. And you're going to release your sperm into the cytoplasm. So I wanted you to see what it looked like when, when the membrane breaks right away and you're able to, to go in and um, just release the sperm. Usually when we see that funnel, that's a good sign. We like to see that funnel. Uh, indicated that the eggs are mature, um, or ripe, uh, as some people would uh, describe it. So as it, just like I do with any other thing, I actually like to squeeze the cytoplasm down and I'm going to release my oocyte. I'll pick up the, the next one, and this one has a couple couple rounds of stirring, 
and the idea is that you're gonna, you're gonna just like I did before come in about halfway and I'm gonna push forward I'm watching that membrane to see if it breaks watching closely as I'm pushing forward so come back to three o'clock and it doesn't matter if you go up or down you're just going to grab a little bit more of that membrane and just stretching that membrane out um, the whole purpose of this is just not to use the aspiration to break and hopefully be less traumatic on the egg the membrane still hasn't broken so I'm going to come back to, uh, to three o'clock you can see the cytoplasm is actually sticking to the uh, the needle here and so um, that's I think that's real important that your ix, that your ICSI needle does not do that. This isn't the best example of this. Um, so I'm in the process of changing needles to make sure that doesn't work. As you can see right here, it's going to break right here. Push forward, you see that membrane pop back over the, the needle. I give it a little bit of aspiration. Uh, probably not as much as I would if I was doing the aspirate and break method. And I just release the cytoplasm, or the oocyte into the cytoplasm back and I'd still squeeze it down to some I call these love taps actually so that's uh, really pretty much everything with uh, some dish preps some ICSI some tool maintenance and uh, and so on so uh, uh, some technical tips and tricks that I hope you find uh, I find useful So I'd like to thank you for uh, hanging out with us today. And uh, if you need to call me here directly, here is my, my contact info. And I'd love to hear from you.